All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us today for another exciting installment of the Success Edge interview series. This series is all about diving into the stories and strategies of remarkable individuals who have carved out their path to success. Today, we have a truly inspiring guest with us, Sandra Clark. I've known her for quite some time now, and um, she has transformed life's unexpected twist into a flourishing consulting and training business. With her extensive background as a consultant and a trainer for both individuals and businesses, she's on a mission to empower people to shine on LinkedIn and help small businesses making a lasting impression that translates into tangible results. Her approach centers around making social media accessible and effective for her clients. So today we're going to dive deep into LinkedIn's ever-evolving landscape. Uh, Sandra is going to break down some of the intricacies of the platform into manageable, actionable steps aimed at just helping you to get desi your desired results. Uh, so grab your notes and let's get started. <laughs> so welcome, Sandra. I'm excited to be here. It's always fun to talk to you, Tiffany. Yes, you too. I always enjoy our time together. Um, and I'm so glad that you came on today. And because um, LinkedIn, you know, we were just talking about it beforehand is is an ever evolving landscape. And it's like, stay out of LinkedIn jail. How do I do that? How do I grow my business? How do I show up professionally? What should my, you know, headline say in my about section? And, and then it's, there's some staples, right? That are constant. Um, but then there's lots of parts of LinkedIn that keep evolving, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about how you got started. Why did, why did you become so involved with LinkedIn and con co consulting and training people on how to use it? Well, I'm kind of an accidental entrepreneur. <laughs> I would never have seen myself as having my own business, could not even imagine it, working on my own, having the self-discipline to do that. You know, wouldn't I be lonely? How would I know what to do? But after uh, a long career at the University of California, they decided that they'd rather not pay my salary no, <laughs> so they pushed me out of my, my nest and who knew, but I found I could fly. So it turned out to be a wonderful experience. I did. I realized I didn't really want to go and work for someone else. I started doing this on the side. I would go to those classes they offer when you're laid off, you know, how to do your resume, interview skills, LinkedIn. And after the LinkedIn classes, people were coming up to me and saying, Sandra, could you sit with me and show me how to do that? I don't get it. And you seem to understand it. So after about 20 of that, those people, people said, you know, you should be charging for this. You're really good at it. So out of that, a business was born and there was no looking back. I mean, who knew? Years ago, I was a teacher. Uh, years ago, I was a theater director. So I used to make people look good on the stage. Now I like to say, make them look good on the stage of LinkedIn. And once a teacher, always a teacher. So I um, use those skills. That's my approach to LinkedIn. And so everything I've done in my life finally made sense, though my family would have doubted it along the way. Like all of those steps brought you to this place. <laughs> so tell us about, um, I love on your headline, you, you put social media for the socially reluctant. What does that mean? Well, it started sort of as a joke, and I included it in the main verbiage, not on my headline, some years ago, um, because it's hard to come up with a catchy saying to say LinkedIn for the social media reluctant it didn't kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, so although I specifically and exclusively do LinkedIn, it just was catchy and funny and caught people's attention. And I discovered so many people are just not comfortable putting themselves out there on LinkedIn. It's like, you got to have a brand, you got to market yourself. It's like, should I show, you know, it feels like showing off. That doesn't feel good. Well, and people were just so uncomfortable about it. So I embraced it and uh, that kind of became, you know, a big part of my brand. And I put it right in the front of my headline. And that's actually not a best practice in terms of the way I teach to put something like that, but I've been doing it long enough that I can break the rules. Yeah, um, yes. You know, we're, we're not brought up to, put ourselves out there in public to market ourselves to come with a brand. I mean, mm -hmm. they should now be teaching that in high school right. uh, because you've got to do it throughout your professional career. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, um, you know, so 
a lot of people, especially once you get past 40, it's just like, I never had to do that stuff. Why would I have to do it now? I just do a great job, nose to the grindstone, work away, and people are going to recognize and know and promote me. It doesn't work like that anymore. Well, yeah, and you're an exact, you're an excellent example of putting yourself out there. I just absolutely love reading you know, just a post, a random thing, a funny thing, a, a intellectual thing. Like you just really change it up so that it's, it's not just so, it's not like a stuffy profile. It's, it's fun and it has personality and it's professional and, people are able to see how they can get the help from you. And, and so you're a real person. And I really admire that about you. Thank you. I have fun thinking about this. What I've found, there's so many people that write really great articles on how to do this. Go here, do that, put this in your headline, put that. And it's already written and that's good stuff. And I find like, if I'm asked to write something, I was asked the other day to do an article for an organization. And it was specifically for students. Mm -hmm. And I, I just couldn't do a straight one. So I had to do why students can break all the rules. Um, you know, I have to be, you know, if you don't appreciate my sense of humor, you're in trouble. But I just had to kind of put a little twist on it to make it a little more fun and interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, and if I make a mistake, if I do something wrong, I use it as an example. It's like, if I'm not going to share it with you, I can't tell you to be brave either. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's why you're such a great example, because you do what you teach and and we see that and you're consistent and have been consistent for a long time. Well, how long have you been doing this business, actually? 13 years. 13. Yeah, I knew it was a while. <laughs> so yeah, you, it goes fast. <laughs> yeah, and you've seen it change a ton, I bet. Oh, my. Yes, I was um, just saying earlier that there were well over 300 changes on LinkedIn just last year. Wow. Over 150 this year so far. Mm -hmm. And the great news is for the folks watching this is you can ignore most of them. Mm. Um, and that's part of what I have to do is I have to know about them all and then just pick out the literally one or two or three that might be valuable to you. Mm. But it's so hard because you go into LinkedIn and you go, oh, my God, who's moved my cheese? It's different than yesterday. And I thought I knew how to do this. What's happened? And you just need to take a deep breath. Relax. And they often will do things and they put it in front of you and you think, well, LinkedIn has said, I've got this. I should do it, right? Um, why not? But they don't understand it. And mm -hmm. so they accept it and they end up doing something silly. Somebody the other day, and I'm going to write about that. I started the article about um, you can add skills to showcase under your experience section and about. And she added a new skill, kind of a little bit of fun on tarot, tarot reading. Oh yeah. And because LinkedIn popped up, do you want to add this to your profile? She didn't understand what they were saying. So she added it. So under her about section and under each of her experiences, serious professional stuff, it had one skill listed, tarot reading. <laughs> so you know, unintended consequences. So just because LinkedIn offers it to you, don't necessarily accept. Mm -hmm. That's true for creator mode and things like that. There are advantages, but people say, oh, LinkedIn offered me this thing. Isn't it great? Well, maybe, maybe not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why would, why should people be on LinkedIn? Well, if I go to a professional meeting, conference or anything, and I meet you, maybe I get your business card, although I'm wondering whether business cards are even going to be around in the future. We'll just use a QR code. Yeah. Um, and you you know, I take it back and I look you up on LinkedIn, maybe write a message to connect and continue in the conversation. If you're not on LinkedIn, I'm sorry, but it's almost like you don't exist. I, I mean, I don't know what to do with the card. Now, if there's something I urgently want to do with that person right away, I might email them. But to email them just to stay in touch? Probably not, especially if I meet quite a few people at an event. So it's a great way to stay in touch. To, you know, if I meet you, then I look at your LinkedIn profile and say, like, oh, I didn't know she went to the same school as me. Oh, I see she's connected to Karen. I love Karen. I didn't know that. You know, so now I've got all these conversation starters to stay in place. So it's just uh, stay in touch. There's so much over your professional lifetime 
that, you know, where else can you stay in touch with people where people will update their own information, their own contact information? Um, it's like you sort of have to, even if you do it minimally and just have the basics, there's so much more you can do. But um, even if you do the basics, it's still, you know, I, there are certain professions, maybe, you know, if you're in a service industry, car repair, um, industrial stuff, Maybe you don't need to be on LinkedIn, but for the most part, most professionals do. Yeah. And then do you think like, I know I get tons of people that are requesting to be a connection and, um, and like right now there's a ton of that going on where everybody's, Hey, we should connect or we know mutual friends or love the work you're doing. You know, all of those kind of messages, how do we know who we should be connecting with or not? I mean, do we just connect with everybody? Do we just build our, grow our network? Great question. Um, and you want to grow your network, but I do not recommend connecting with just anybody and everybody. It's, um, you want to be strategic about it. So if somebody asks to connect with you and their headline says something like, you know, six figures in six weeks or something like that, you know, you know, they're just going to try and sell you. Why bother? Just remove them. Um, so I do think it's worth the time to look at the request to connect and look at the profile. See, is this someone professional, respectable? Do they have a decent network? Um, do we have something in common? There are things that LinkedIn now allow you to like. You can see when that person first opened a LinkedIn account. And if it's this year, there's a really good chance there are a lot of spam accounts on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, so very cautious about those, although sometimes people come to me because they are brand new and need help. So I might be a little gentler. So you mm -hmm. want to look and see if this is somebody, if I went to a networking event, could I network with them? Could I have something to talk to them about? And if they are, accept and then start a conversation. Mm -hmm. And if the first thing they do is try and sell you, don't even waste your time. Just immediately delete don't just ignore, but delete them, remove them as a connection. It's easy to do. It does not send out a notice to them. You have been deleted, um, but just get rid of them. Don't waste your time. Do it quickly and move on to the next better opportunity. Mm -hmm. But yeah. yeah, keep growing, but do it strategically mm -hmm. and pick and choose who you want to. You mentioned all the messages they send. No, those messages actually sounded fairly friendly and nice. Mm -hmm. Um too many of them come with like a sales pitch or with no message at all. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, well, why do you want to connect? So now I've got to write to you and say, well, thanks for the invitation, but tell me, you know, why would you like co to connect? How do you see us having a relationship together? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, stretch a little beyond your comfort zone, but mm -hmm. don't go wild and yeah. don't send out too many requests yourself at a time or, you, or you'll be seen as spamming people and LinkedIn might ban you. Do not ever use automation tools. If LinkedIn catch you, they will restrict or remove your account. And that is a nightmare. Yeah. Yes, definitely. I've had experiences where they've paused our account and was like, what are you doing? <laughs> they think we're a bot. And I'm just like, no, we're not. We're not using bots. <laughs> so they are They are protective. They, they want to make sure that people are protected on LinkedIn. So I can appreciate it. Definitely. Yeah, what they found is they used to go after the companies that did this automation stuff, and they learned that they couldn't win the losses, and they were expensive, so they stopped. So they mm -hmm. went to us, the vulnerable users, just took us down. So my account was restricted three times last year, and I'm pretty squeaky clean on the right. things they do or don't do. Right. It, and they, of course, they don't necessarily tell you what you've done. So we think what I did is I had multiple tabs open. I will often do that. Like I'll, I'll do a search for maybe examples for my clients, and then I'll open up a new tab for each person so I can compare them and look. Mm -hmm. And then the page refreshes. Um, LinkedIn sees that as automation. Mm -hmm. So we think maybe that that's what I did. So never have more than five tabs open at a time. And um, the other things, automation, you shouldn't do. But it's this, I've had friends recently who've been, had their accounts blocked, removed. They don't know what they did. There are quirky things, like if you put something in your name uh, field, 
Mm -hmm. uh, this person had put in a uh, copyright symbol. And that was the reason they took him down. You're not allowed to put other things. Now, you might get away with it. Sometimes people think they're very clever by putting in what they do in their name headline or um, some quirky thing or some symbols. Don't do it. Put it in your headline under your name if you have to, but not in your name line. It really, if you read your terms of service, who read their LinkedIn terms of service when they sign them? Right. I don't think anybody. But it's <laughs> Don't do it. And it's grounds for immediately taking you down. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard to get back on when you're taken down. I mean, they are very unforgiving. And there's no person you can reach out to to plead your case. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's pretty it's ugly. Fine. So I have to mention in the same line, make sure you've got a really good password on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Don't share it. And use the um, two-factor um, protection feature. Mm -hmm um you will be glad you did so i mean there are other things you can also do i mean it's better to use the authenticator than it is just to text to your phone you know things like that but if you use a really good password and use some kind of two-factor uh, you'll be in reasonably good protected shape awesome yeah no that's really good to know especially with everything going on these days online <clears throat> so, so fun things about linkedin besides these boring scary things yes yes what is what are some fun things? <laughs> What's the number one thing that you a piece of advice you'd give us? Uh, you know, I think it would be just do it. Yeah. Get over yourself, your discomfort, and just do something. Now it doesn't have to be all these fancy things that you can't do. It doesn't have to be posting all of this stuff, but just make sure that you're on LinkedIn, make sure you've got the basic fields all filled in make sure you've got a recent headshot no more than two or three years old and um, it should be just your head neck to your shoulders not the body shot you know the uh, power uh, shots that you had taken when you did your photography session um have your a, a good headline that explains what it is you do your value proposition please don't forget your about section this is the one thing that people tend to avoid doing it's like I know what to say about myself so um you know it's not meant to be that boring top of resume little summary it's meant like your 30 second elevator pitch like you go to a meeting who are you what do you do what are you all about so have the information there at the very least have your work history have your skills and then start pushing yourself to do a little more like at two connections a day is that too hard I hope not. Um, like somebody's post. You're too shy to even do that publicly. Send a private message to somebody just to stay in touch, but just do something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I agree. Definitely. And just starting with what you know and can do, and then start adding in those little pieces that are outside of your comfort zone, something you've never done before. And this continue building on that. Yeah. I love I know that. Some of your audience in particular, Tiffany, are a little more advanced, like they're posting or trying to post regularly on LinkedIn and liking and commenting and participating in the conversation, which is great. And um, people will ask me, well, what's the best kind of post to do? What gets the most visibility? And I used to try and you know advise people, teach people to do different kinds of posts, text posts text and image posts, document posts, video posts, all the rest. And then they wouldn't because it seemed too overwhelming. Say, what is the kind of post that you are willing to commit to doing regularly, consistently? Um, and do that. Now, is it good to have a variety of different types of posts? Yeah. But if you do something regularly, you're still going to be um, ahead of majority of other people on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um, so just find something you're willing to do and do it. Um, the number, when it says number of views, number of views is actually number of impressions. It doesn't mean people saw it. So don't get too excited. Number of views is the number of people who might have seen it if they happen to be looking at that time. Mm -hmm. so I mean, they did. doesn't mean they'll look at it, but they might see it. So don't get all excited. I call the number of views LinkedIn's love for you. 
how many people they share it out to, but the likes and comments are people's love for you. That's real people who have to like it, comment and do something. Mm. So that's a much better measurement. Uh, there are statistically, I'm not even sure if that's the right word, things that do better like text posts, funnily enough, do very well. I kind of find them boring without a picture. I love text plus an image. Document posts do really well, but they're harder work to do a nice document post. That's one where you can kind of scroll through like a slideshow mm -hmm. and have just a few words on each slide. They do very well. People like them, but um, if you're really savvy on Canva, you can create a really pretty one. I'm not, and I find them hard work to do but they do really well. An image only post, lots of people will like it, but they don't know what to say about it. What do you say? Pretty picture. Um, so um, just, you know, just find something you're willing to do and keep doing it, make it your own. People love videos. If you use videos, always use captions because people will often not have the sound on when they're at work. So you want them to be able to read it. Um, a long article, like a, the long articles blog posts that we used to do, are not going to get much visibility because people don't want to have to click and open them up. Mm -hmm. People in general don't like to have to click and go somewhere else. So if you want to share an article, very few people are actually going to open it and read it. It doesn't mean never do it. If that's the thing you're willing to do, add a little bit of thoughtful commentary on it and share it while you've shared it, then do it. But I wouldn't. Um, if I was advising you how to get the best visibility, that would not be one of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, um, if, um, thank you, Sandra, I appreciate that. Those are all such helpful tips. Uh, what would you say, um, just to kind of let others know how they can connect with you? How, what's the best way to connect with you to, you know, hire you or have you help them with their profiles? Um, thank you for asking. Yeah. Uh, LinkedIn, I would say Sandra Clark. That's I'm usually, although there's over a thousand Sandra Clarks on LinkedIn, I'm usually fairly easy to find. They usually show up fairly high uh, in the searches. If you look for my website online, LinkedIn mentoring, I'm pretty easy to find. Uh, and then email is great. LinkedIn messages are fine. I'm mm -hmm. email kind of gal. I'm old fashioned that way. But uh, <laughs> um, yeah, look on phone, I may not answer the phone, but you can always leave a message. Yeah. Uh, emails are uh, the best and you know connect with me on LinkedIn if you send me a message on LinkedIn tell me how you know me one is a great conversation starter and also so if somebody is in my class I'm much more inclined to be a little more helpful I try to be helpful to everybody but I may be a little more helpful to them if I've met someone through you they kind of earn brownie points just because they're connected to you so I'm more likely to kind of go out of my way not only to connect with them but to try and help so it's um, especially, you know, you help a lot of coaches as uh, your kind of specialty. And I joined uh, coaches groups um, a few years ago. I thought maybe I wanted to be a, a coach in my next career iteration. Yeah. And I discovered that I think I was pretty good at it, but it was what I love doing is this LinkedIn consulting. Get in there with someone a couple of hours, get it done and move on. But what I learned is I love coaches, just love the community. So I hung on and stayed in the group for years just because I like the people so much. And so coaches own a little special place in my heart. Love to connect with them. Tell me your coach and what you're trying to put out into the world. And if I've got any you know, free tips or whatever, I will certainly try to help you. But reach out, connect. Um, I love anybody who's a friend of Tiffany's, you know, uh, it's probably worth knowing. <laughs> well, thank you, Sandra. I put your contact information in the comments of uh, on this video. And so definitely reach out to Sandra. She is a joy to work with. Um, so, well, thank you again for being with us today. Um, this was another episode of our interview series. And just a sincere thank you to be, uh, for being here and sharing your, your insights and your journey with us. Um, and uh, yeah, anybody needing to connect on LinkedIn uh, to do's or do's and don'ts, reach out to Sandra. And then remember, we will be back another time with another guest to learn more about success. So until then, keep chasing your dreams and pushing your boundaries. And we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.